Hello and welcome to Probability, Significance and Chi-Squared. In today's session we're going to look at the crucial concept of probability, significance, we're going to look at the sort of errors that can occur in statistical testing and we're going to carry out our first Chi-Squared test. To recap uh, hypotheses from AS then, there are two broadly speaking categories of hypothesis, the null and the alternative. Remember that the null says nothing will happen, there will be no correlation, and the alternative states that there will be an effect, there will be a difference, there is a correlation. You'll notice the nomenclature we use A2 to describe these two, uh, or to highlight these two hypotheses are a H, capital H with a small zero, represents your null hypothesis, and your alternative is your H1. Now to make this a little more uh, complex, A2, they introduce this concept of tails. And really this is very similar to describing the directional and non-directional natures of your hypothesis. So a one-tailed hypothesis is just a directional hypothesis. It is one that states the outcome of a study and what the directions, uh, the direction of the results. And a two-tailed says, yes, there'll be a, a difference, there'll be a relationship, but we don't know what that relationship will be. Um, you, I'll use terms like directional and uh, one-tailed, two-tailed interchangeably. So you must get comfortable with these terms. Why one-tailed then, or two-tailed? Imagine a cat, a cat with one tail. If the tail indicates this direction, having one tail means the cat will move in a direction. And you'll be able to predict the direction that the cat moves in. But now imagine that it had two tails, both trying to decide which direction the cat was going in. You wouldn't be able to predict it. But you know the cat would move, you just don't know uh, which direction it will move in. A terrible analogy, but hopefully helps you understand this a bit better. Right, significant. We understand intuitively what the word significant means and what significance means in our daily lives. An obvious example would be something like uh, your performance in two tests. If you got 71% in your first test and then 73% in your second, do you rejoice? You have shown improvement. Do you go out and cel celebrate with a uh, with a cheeky Nando's, or do you say, "Well, actually, that I have done better, objectively, but could that variance of two percent purely have been a result of chance? Have you objectively got better, as in you're a better student, or could that be natural variation that occurs?" You'll have an appreciation of that. Another example might be some of us sometimes think that we're lucky or unlucky. In reality, there's no such thing. But imagine uh, on a particular day, you walk into school. Uh, you, it's a beautiful sunny day, so you don't take your umbrella. All of a sudden, torrential downpour. So you get drenched. As you walk in um, past the road, a truck drives up and splashes you with a big puddle. So now you're drenched. You walk into school, you've forgotten your lanyard, so you get in trouble for that. All your books are wet, so you can't hand in your homework, you don't know what's going on in the lesson. At what point, you know, your, your partner phones you up and dumps you? At what point will you say, actually, this is significantly a bad day? There is a threshold for significance, and in science, this is crucial. For science, we are saying, what is the threshold, what is the significance level that results occurred due to chance or because of something we did. There is a philosophical question to do with significance and we can expand this a bit more. Imagine you played the lottery, I'll ask you this in class probably, what sum would be significant to change your life forever? For some people this would be a few thousand pounds, you know, 50,000 is a, is a sum that would let people pay off chunks of their mortgage. Um, for some it might be millions, they might want hundreds of millions. What sum would be too much? You know, if you had 10 million, that sounds, I can just about encapsulate in my head how I could spend 10 million, I'd give most of it away, but what about 100 million? That's a lot of money. 
if you could make yourself more attractive, how much would you make yourself attractive by? Um, would you just would you want to be the most attractive person on the planet? Imagine how lonely a life that would be. I always I remember Natalie Portman, who's an attractive woman, in an interview saying that one of the limitations of fame was that men um, were intimidated and wouldn't approach her because in some ways she was too attractive. So what level would be too much? How much would you increase it? And my personal favorite is IQ. How intelligent would you want to be? I'm quite happy sometimes with, with simple ideas. You know, I like complexity, but every now and then I like simple ideas. But if I was super intelligent, if I was a savant, would I actually enjoy life in the same way? I don't know. So back to the topic, level of significance. In order to know whether a result is significant, we need to know what the likelihood is that those results could have occurred due to chance. Um, if they occurred due to chance, then they can be treated as random. In psychology, we can never be 100% certain. In fact, in any science, even physics, which is very robust, very precise, even in phys physics, they can never be 100% certain. There is always uncertainty. So we come up, we use the idea of probability. And P stands for probability. In probability theory, we express something like 5% as 0 0.05, with 1 being 100%. Therefore, if our probability is 0 0.9, uh, 0 0.05% or 0 0.05, we're saying that there is a 5% chance our results could have occurred due to random, uh, randomly. This means that there's a 95% confidence level that our results were the consequence of whatever we did, or that they do show a relationship or difference. Another way of putting that is this. Imagine I gave you a multiple choice test on a subject that you knew nothing about, let's say quantum physics or Arabic or the history of Malaysia. Now you may be an expert in all three of these fields, but just imagine that I gave you a multiple choice test and you know nothing about any of these topics. What is the probability that if you took that test a hundred times, that at least one of those times or two of those times you'd score quite high? just by chance, just by randomly selecting the appropriate answers. That's kind of what we're talking about with our p-values. So if you have a p-value of, of 5%, what you're saying is, if you conducted the experiment 100 times, you would expect that at least five sets of those results to be purely the result of chance. But the other 95% were the result of your own manipulations. This is a very complex concept to get your head around, but that's the basics. If you want to learn more about level of significance, um, please do stick with me, otherwise speed ahead a little bit. This is really bizarre because actually, we're not really talking about significance of results. Um, if this confuses you, it should, this is quite difficult stuff. You don't need to know this for the spec, by the way. This is just one of those interesting side tangents. What we're really doing with significance is we're really saying, does the sample that we've selected, often the sample, represent the population? Or did that sample occur by chance? And one way of looking at this is, imagine a group of students. Within the group of students, there are students with A grades and students with C. If I randomly select from all my students in psychology and put 10 students in one group and 10 in another, it is possible, though unlikely, that all 10 in group A are A star A students and all 10 in group B are C students. That is possible. So what we're really talking about with significance really is the uh, or probability is we're saying that there's a 5% probability that the sample we've selected occurred due to chance and is not representative of the 
wider population. If you're interested in this, uh, by all means come see me. But you can treat it for the exam, you can treat it as though the chance of the results or the probability of the results occurring due to chance, but it's actually more about this population. Okay, here's an example of significance. Um, Loftus investigated the effect of misleading information. We know this. She had smashed, hit, all those conditions. She analyzed the results. She used an unrelated t test. We'll come to this in a few lessons' time. Uh, so, this was her um, conclusion. In this case, she is using a probability level of 0.05, i.e. a 5% probability that a result occurred due to chance. And she's calculated this value that says to her, my results are accurate. My results do show a difference between the hit and smashed group. However, even though my results are significant, there is still this 5% probability that they just occurred due to chance. And this is made even worse by the fact that IC Loftus only had 45 participants. But we'll come back to that in a minute. So 5% is deemed an acceptable risk in this case, and this is Loftus's actual conclusion from her paper. Lower significance levels. Um, this is a study that um, has come out recently, uh, literally this year that has completely overturned Meltzoff and Moore's study on early interaction. This means that the study, um, the results that were produced occurred due to chance in Meltzoff and Moore's study, likely. There's two possibilities. It's either due to chance or it's due to some sort of nefarious activity on the part of the experimenters, such as a deliberate uh, fraud or um, poor research design, or sometimes investigator effects. So what happened in Belsoff and Moore's study is that assuming everything else is above board and there was no fraud or anything, there was that 5% probability that the infant's results, their, their interactional synchrony and their reciprocity just occurred due to chance. When Belsoff and Moore smiled at them and they smiled back, it just occurred by chance. That 5% probability occurred in this case. And in um, Austin Brooks' um, latest study, they've shown that that was just a random result. And, and this is really important because this means the research has been discredited and now we use a new piece of research in our explanation of early interaction. Now, a 5% probability, what were the consequences of Meltzoff and Moore believing their early interaction, interactional synchrony and reciprocity of babies only um, really a few uh, weeks old? Well, none really. There, there's a lot of textbooks that need reprinting. Students have learned information that's not real. Parents may have tried a bit harder to engage with their very, very young infants. So that could be a good thing because they think they're actually interacting with them. But, but the negatives are not the end of the world. You know, no one's, uh, in theory, no one has died as a result. But compare this to medical research. What if you had a drug, a cure, but there was a 5% probability that that cure doesn't work? If the research um, produces uh, evidence to support drugs that don't work. That means that you are likely to take that drug thinking it does work, which is not harmful in itself, assuming there are no side effects. But what does that mean? If you're taking a drug that doesn't work, you are not engaging in treatment that does. And that could be a real problem. So in the medical field, they often use significance levels that are much more stringent for drug testing such as a p-value of 0.01, which means there is only a 1% probability that the, that the improvements from the drug occurred due to chance and not the drug. 
Uh, we'll look at this in more detail as we go through. Now, how stringent your p-value is can actually affect um, what happens in your results. So in Melt Sulfur More, for example, Melt Sulfur More, again, assuming everything was above board with the study, Melt Sulfur More had a type 1 error. A type 1 error is when you accept a result that isn't true when you say there is a difference and there isn't and in the in the correct terminology it's when you say when you reject the null hypothesis that says there's no difference and you say there is a difference um, falsely in other words you have stated a difference when there is no difference. This is, your drug doesn't work, but people have improved anyway, and therefore you say, aha, look, that's evidence that the drug works, that's your type one error. Here's a little mnemonic to help you remember this. So type one or one, type one and type two errors. Little story, one thought he won the lottery. So we've got a lot of ones there. So he spent all his money. He checked the ticket again, but the numbers didn't match up. Type 1, 1 error. So a false positive. This is far worse than a false negative. So just one more time. One thought he won the lottery. So he thought there was an effect, but there wasn't. He, be he acted on that. When he checked again, it didn't match up. So a type 1 error is when you think there's an effect and there isn't. Um, a type 2 error is when you think there's no effect, no difference, no correlation, when in fact there is. In other words, you accept the null hypothesis and say there's no difference, when actually there was a difference. Ask yourself, pause it, maybe have a think about it, which of these has more severe consequences? a type 1 or a type 2 error. Actually, they both have severe consequences, but generally speaking in science and in life, a type 1 error is worse. If we think about one, he spends all his money, that's ruined his life, or at least for the time being. A type 2 error, where he's won the lottery but he doesn't realise it, if he's later shown to have won the lottery, then that's just a nice surprise, assuming the ticket hasn't expired or anything like that. So that's just a nice surprise. So if we carry out research and we accept the null hypothesis and say there's no difference, then we go away, we're a bit sad that we've invested all this time and money in research, but it's not the end of the world. If then later our hypothesis is shown to be correct and that actually there is a difference, there is an effect, then we say, woohoo, that's great, I'm, you know, I'm better off than I was compare that to our hypothesis that is wrong, that is upheld for a very long time. A couple of hypotheses, uh, the world is flat, was maintained for a long time, the earth is the center of the universe, was maintained for a long time. The cost of believing those was much higher um, and resulted in all sorts of things, including religious persecution. A little bit on significance level and sample size, this is really important. So actually, the level at which, the significance level you have to reach, um, or the, the, the value, the test statistic, or the critical value you have to meet, let's say, um, varies with size. So think about this in terms of correlation. If we want to find out if there's a relationship between the amount of time you spend studying and your grades, and we do it on five people, we'd want a really strong uh, outcome from that study, okay? So if, if two of them showed no relationship but three did, we wouldn't say, aha, conclusive. But now magnify that as sort of 20,000 people. That becomes a huge difference. Uh, another example is um, imagine a virus that kills 1.4% of the people infected. Someone at school contracts the virus, there are 2,000 people at school, 
This basically results in 28 deaths. It is devastating. 28 deaths is devastating. But out of 2000, it's not the end of the world. Now magnify the population to the size of the UK. We're dealing with 882,000 deaths. The Consider the consequences if you had a treatment of these two different um, outcomes. If you had a treatment that uh, resulted in 1.4% um, deaths, that would be significant if the, if the population you were testing on was about 2,000. But imagine how much more significant that would be at that level. So what we're saying is, as the population goes up, the uh, hurdle that you have to jump over, the, the critical value we'll look at later, as he goes down. Because a small effect can, is amplified by a larger sample. One more, uh, just to consolidate it in your mind. If 1% of people in, on my psychology course uh, would quite like to see me hit by a bus, um, that's fine, that's not even a whole person. Uh, A2, I'm saying. So A2, that's I got about 55, let's say about half a person. So I'm not sure how that work out. Maybe they just want to see me maimed rather than actually killed. But now amplify that school wide. So 1% of the people at school want to, you can see how this escalates. That's more significant. Now I'm, I'm watching my back. Now imagine that 1% of the population um, want to see me hit by a bus. I'm afraid to cross the road now because you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. Okay? So, significance level and sample size. Right, let's get into the juice bit. That's significance. That's probability. Let's do something. Let's calculate some chi squared. Now, this uh, doesn't look very friendly, but it's actually very simple. Um, it's one of the simpler equations you can carry out. This is referred to as a non-parametric test. Before we get stuck into this, I just need to remind you that we have these levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. The key one we're gonna be working with today is nominal. You know about ordinal, we've done a lot of that in the experiments. We've used some interval data like ratio, uh, um, We've talked about measuring things with centimeters and stuff like that. And we've used some ratio data with absolute zeros. But we're focusing on nominal today. This first data that could be placed in categories, and then you count the frequency of occurrences of those behaviors. So you did something similar for your meta-analysis. Quick thing on parametric versus non-parametric. We'll revisit this uh, perhaps every presentation. There are eight statistical tests you need to know for the exam, but they're not all used for the same reasons. And one distinction that we make between these tests is whether they're parametric or non-parametric. All parametric means, remember metric means measurements to do with space, but really what it means is metric means um, precise measurement, let's say. What you really need to know is that a parametric test tends to be more scientific uh, using interval data and those sorts of things. Non-parametric tests t tend to produce less robust results, less reliable results. So parametric. Um, parametric tests use mean and standard deviation. These are obviously clear values, aren't they? Uh, compared to non-parametric tests, which use ranked data. So you've actually manipulated the data in some way, i.e. by ranking it or categorizing it. And therefore, you're not necessarily dealing with the direct output from your study. You've, you've had to manipulate it. Researchers usually prefer parametric tests as a more powerful and can detect significance in cases that non-parametric tests cannot. But non-parametrics tend to be a little easier to carry out and we'll see why. So when do we use this test? This is the most important slide on chi-squared. So you must know each and every single one of these criteria before we even start. So you can use chi-squared 
very rarely amongst statistical tests for both an association or a test for difference. So you can say association is another word for relationship. It's the one we use when we're talking about chi-squared, in interestingly enough. But an association between hair colour and personality, or extraversion, it could be an association. Or a difference between hair colour, blondes, brunettes, and extraversions, high and low. Data in each cell in the contingency table, we'll look at that in a minute, is independent, so it cannot be, uh, you cannot be both a blonde and a brunette, we'll have a look at that in a minute. And the data are nominal. Just a quick note, when we refer to data, data is a plural. Um, the data are nominal is a perfectly grammatical sentence. Well, perhaps not perfectly, but it's a grammatical sentence. You say data are rather than data is. Um, each, particip uh, each participant belongs to all the categories. So relationship between education level and gender, we take something like age, we could turn it into categorical data by saying you're either less than or equal to 30 years old or greater than. Favourite search engine, uh, that's probably going back a bit, but you know, Google or Bing. These are categories, nominal data. So procedure, all these begin the same way. State the hypothesis, either one or two-tailed. We'll always work on the assumption of, of a one-tailed hypothesis, but uh, be very careful because we use different values for a, um, uh, a two-tailed. Then we place the raw data in a contingency table. This is a contingency table. So in this case, we're looking at whether or not males and females prefer, is there a difference between gender and preference for dogs and cats, pet ownership? In this case, we then just put in the frequency. So we've asked um, in total 100 people, uh, 48, uh, sorry, 48 females and 52 males in total, if you add those up. Of the 52 males, 42 said that they prefer dogs, and 10 said they prefer cats. And then we flip it, and nine females say they like dogs, and 39 say they like cats. They could be uh, cat ladies, so. So, if we just go back to our criteria, data in each cell in the contingency table are independent. Let's have a look. The data here are independent. You can't be a male who prefers dogs and a male who prefers cats. You can't be both. You have to be one or the other. So these data are independent. So we put in our raw data. So I've counted 42 males who said that they prefer dogs, 10 males who prefer cats, nine females prefer dogs, 39 females who prefer cats. I think you just give them an arbitrary label, so we've got A, B, C, D. This helps with the table. This doesn't really mean anything, though. So this is cell A, this is cell B, cell C, cell D. The thing I have to do, then, is calculate the total. So all you do is add them up. So 42 add 10 is 52, 9 add 39 is 48, and then the same down here. And that all adds up, obviously, those two add up to 100, as do they. So that adds up to your total number of participants in your study. Then we put together this table. This table is what we're going to use in order to calculate our chi-squared. The first calculation is a row times column calculation, and we divide it by the total. So a row, such as um, this, is then times by the column. We do that for each cell. So cell A, we have the total row is 52. We multiply that by the total column, which is 51, and we divide the whole thing by the total, i.e. 100. So it becomes 52 times 51 divided by 100. B then is 52 times 49 divided by 100. C is 48 times 51 divided by 100. And then D is 48 times 49 divided by 100. And that gives us this first column. 
the second column, we subtract the E uh, from the expected frequencies that we've just calculated, this is the E column. We take the expected frequencies and we minus from it the actual observed values. There's an error here, there should be a point uh, 0.52, I don't know what's happened there. So we take uh, 26.52 and we minus from it 42. We take 25.48 and we minus from it 10 because in B that's the raw value. So it's the expected you've just calculated minus the actual. And you do that for this column. You then square the results very simply. And once you've squared the results of this column, you then do a bit of shifty calculation where you take your value from this column and you just divide it by the, the outcome of this column. And that will produce these single well, these numbers here. The final act is to sum the lots. You just add up each of those. And we come up with a chi squared in that case, sorry, of 38.42. So, we've rounded it to uh, 0.42, uh, so we've rounded it to two decimal places. This will affect our chi-squared a little bit. If you calculate this using a, a calculator as a continuous calculation, you'll find that a lot of these have decimal places that go long into the distance. So you might get just an ever so slightly um, different outcome for example if you use an online tool but they're very broadly the same once we so we found the observed value of x of chi squared which is 38.61 we now then have to decide the following in here so let's go on and decide that so this is our critical table and if you remember from sign test we're looking for a value to be less than or equal to well in chi squared we're actually looking for it to be greater or equal to. And the thing to remember about chi-squared and these uh, tests are if it's greater or equal to, you can, find, you can tell if it's supposed to be greater or less than based on whether or not there is an R in the title of the statistical test. So chi-square has an R, so we're looking for greater. Sine does not have an R, so you're looking for less than. And I'll repeat that as we go along and do other tests. So this is our critical table. These are the values that the thing we've just worked out, the chi-squared, must meet or exceed, must be greater than or equal to, in order for us to say, yep, our results are significant, okay? So we know we're using a p-value in 0 0.05, so this is the column we're gonna be looking at because we're gonna say it's a one-tailed Hypothesis. Now, if it was a two-tailed hypothesis, you'd be looking at this column. But it's one-tailed, so we're going to look at this column here. The degrees of freedom, we work out using this formula here. In other words, you take the contingency uh, rows, so we've got um, two rows and two columns. So if we just have a look at our um, formula, rows minus one times columns minus one is 2 minus 1 is 1, 2 minus 1 is 1, therefore it's 1 times 1. 1 times 1 is 1. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. So we know what degrees of freedom we're using, we're using 1. So our critical value is 2.71. So we've got a chi of 38.42, a critical of 2.71. Now what we got to decide is, is our chi-squared greater or equal to that number? Hopefully you've guessed it. It is bigger. This is greater than this. So, because x uh, chi-squared is, I say 8.42, greater than the critical value of blah, 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 at a significance level of p, 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis, accept the alternative, and say there is a significant difference. And you'll input there whatever the hypothesis was. So if it is um, blondes will score higher, or 
bl uh, yeah, blondes will score higher on a uh, extra version scale than brunettes, you will say there is a difference. Uh, we accept the hypothesis that there is a difference uh, between hair color or blondes will score higher, blondes do score higher or whatever it may be. So you're accepting the alternative, you are rejecting the null. Important. Unlike chi-squared, it needs to be, uh, what? Unlike sine, sorry, chi-squared needs to be greater or equal. Remember this is a grr bit. So if you write it like that, greater, if the test has an R in it, it's got to be greater. These are the tests that have R's in, these are the tests that have to be greater or equal to. Related T, R, unrelated T, R, you get the idea. Sine doesn't have an R in it, uh, Wilcoxon doesn't have an R in it, Man Whitney U doesn't have an R in it, so they're all less than, but these are greater. Right, that's it. You have done it. It's been a long ride. Hopefully, um, you have a better understanding of probability and significance, and you've carried out your first chi-squared. Stay with me, and we'll practice, because the key to success with chi is practice. So I've got a nice little uh, tutorial. I'll take you for a practice example, and then there's one you can try for yourself, and I'll give you the answer in class next time. If you uh, do not need to practice because you're an expert, okay, um, and I'll see you next time. Bye. All right, if you're still here, that's because you're brilliant and you wanna practice the chi-square. So, chi-square work example. We start with a contingency table. So we've collected some data from two groups about two variables, so this could be um, gender, again, males, females, and it could be something like um, political parties that they support, or something like that. So we fill in our contingency table with our values. So TX, we've got 33 people, um, TY, 2, and so forth. So we need to add up the totals. 33 add 2 is 35, 32 add 38, you get the idea. So fill that in now. Okay, let's check our answers. I find um, 35, 70, 40, 65. So the total number of uh, participants we have in this study is 105. Now, we've done that. We need to take our um, table and we need to calculate the expected values for each of the cells. Remember, I said that was cell A, cell B, cell C, cell D. So, let's do it for cell A. We take the row total, which in this case for A is 35. We multiply it by the column total, which is 65, and we divide that 35 times 65 by the overall frequency so 105 so 35 times 65 divided by 105 is 21.667 and we put that value in there now again remember I'm rounding here so there may be some slight issues do that for all the columns this is the value these are the values that I have um, identified and you can compare yours to mine now what we have to do is we have to take the expected value and subtract it from the observed value. So the observed, oh sorry, the observed value and subtract from it the expected. So the observed value for, for cell D is 33. And the expected value, for, oh, sorry, A. The expected value for cell A is 21.667. So we say 33 minus 21.667 equals 11.8. So that goes in this column here. Calculate for the rest and then check your answers in a second. Pause it now. Okay, let's check your answers. 11.33 minus 11.333 and so forth. Right, all we have to do now is square these values. So you take 11.333 and square it. I make it 128.444 and complete the rest of those columns. 
pause the video, complete them now, check your answers in a second. Okay, let's check your answers. I make it 128.444 across the board. We now take this value and divide it by the original expectancy value that we calculated. Okay, so you take 128.444, divide it by 21.667. The answer I get for this column is 5.928. If you got that, fill in the rest. Pause it and we'll check your answers. Okay, let's check your answers. Ta -da. Now, we know what degree of freedom we have, so we can fill in this box, because we got two, so uh, we have two rows and two uh, columns. Two minus one is one, two minus one is one, one times one is one. So the degrees of freedom is one. To calculate the chi-squared, we just add up all the values in this common, uh, column, sum them, and this gives us a chi of 23.342, and a degree of freedom of degrees of freedom of one. So we did it. There's our chi squared. All that's left is our critical values table. So let's assume a one tailed hypothesis at a p value of 0.05. So we're using this column. Degrees of freedom, same as the worked example 2.71. Is this value greater or equal to this value? Yes, it is. The calculated value of chi-squared is 23.34. This is greater than the critical value of that at a significance level of p, uh, 0.05. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative. Note, we didn't put our specifics in there. So we um, accept the hypothesis suggesting there is a difference between gender, a significant difference between gender and favorite pet preference. All right, if you're happy with that, by all means, uh, practice another one. Here's one that you can have a go at. I'm quite happy to give you the answer in class. Do males and females prefer fiction or non-fiction? Is there a difference between males and females? This is a hypothesis, complete question, and I'm happy to check your answers in class. Thank you very much for paying attention. I know this is a long uh, PowerPoint. Hopefully it helps and keep asking questions. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye.